Okay, well, thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you everybody for coming. Uh, so John Kenny was Kilcock's forgotten female, fair opinion. Um, He'd be one of the most influential Fenian that you've never heard of. John was born into a family of wealthy farmers in Brangenstown and spent much of his adult life in New York, where he worked closely with the famous Fenian, John Devoy. He was born on April 24th, the date of the future Easter uprising, in the year Black 47, the worst year of the famine. John and DeVoy probably knew each other in Kildare. John was born less than five years after DeVoy. He lived about 25 kilometers from DeVoy's hometown of Kill, County Kildare. They may have been second cousins through their mothers, Elizabeth Dunn and Margaret Dunn. And John also had close relatives in Nace and may have been related to DeVoy's fiance, Eliza Kenny. Maybe they met when John joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood. It was a time when DeVoy was a very prominent recruiter in the area. When the British began a massive sweep of Fenians in 1866, John's family sent him to Australia under the pretext of furthering his education. But it looks like John actually headed off to the gold rush, made a small fortune. It was a hard life though and his health failed and he was forced to return to Ireland. He left almost immediately for New York. He found a job in the city's largest dry goods importing firm, Mills and Gibb, and he also found his way to the Clan de Gael, which was the Irish Republican Brotherhood's counterpart in America. The Clan was dedicated to Irish freedom using armed force if necessary. John joined the Maine or headquarters branch, which was located in New York and known as the Napertandi. In 1871, DeVoy and Jeremiah O. Donovan Rossa, granted early release from prison, arrived in New York, and they both joined John's chapter of the Clan de Gale. John married a fellow Irish immigrant, Annie Morris, in 1873 and started a family. Uh, they both became U.S. citizens. In 1876, John played a major role in DeVoy's audacious scheme to rescue six Fenian prisoners from an inescapable British prison in Western Australia. Rescue gained the Klan international fame and recognition, greatly boosted their power. John rose quickly through the ranks of both Mills and Gibb and the Clan de Gale. He traveled frequently to Ireland, both on business and with his growing family. John was on the executive committee of the Klan, and by the early 1880s, he became president of the New York branch. This proved to be one of the most deadly and contentious periods in the Klan's history. In 1882, a young Tom Clark arrived in New York and was welcomed into the Klan de Gale by John. Clark soon became secretary and worked closely with John, the president. John and Clark would continue to work together until Clark's death. Under John's presidency, the Klan took a new direction, supporting the Land League and Home Rule rather than armed insurrection. The Klan sponsored both Michael David and Charles Stuart Parnell on highly successful American tours. They gained not only exposure, but significant funding. But just by these funds, the tenant farmers were better able to stand up to the landlords. The Irish National Land League of New York was set up with DeVoy as president and John as secretary. The Land League in the United States eventually grew to 1,500 branches and collected half a million dollars for Parnell. But not everyone in the Klan agreed with this direction. A group of men known as the Action Men, and led by Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, favored bombing runs into England. The Action Men gained control of the Klan when Chicago politician Alexander Sullivan was elected president at the national level. He was also elected president of the Land League in America. The IRB was fiercely opposed to the bombing raids as they led to serious backlash against the Irish in Britain. Sullivan's answer was to cut the ties to the IRB. Devoy was beside himself. 
it was unthinkable for the Klan to work against the IRB's best interests. He was also concerned that Sullivan could exert influence on David and Parnell, now that he had control of the very sizable funds of both the Klan Nigel and the Land League. Trump's chapter of the Klan openly protested the split, and Sullivan expelled them from the Klan. Other chapters of the Klan protested, and Sullivan expelled them also. Devoy traveled across the country organizing the expelled Klan chapters, and then arranged the large meeting to be held in Brooklyn in January of 1887. Juan had long harbored a dream of returning to Ireland. If he moved there now, he could repair the damage done by Sullivan by reestablishing the ties between the IRB and the expelled clan chapters. He could also secret cha secretly channel funds from these clans to David Parnell and the now outlawed Land League and thus offset some of Sullivan's influence. Juan's brother arranged for him to lease two properties. One was a prosperous farm in Brangenstown, about a half mile out of side of Kilcock, and the other was a hunting lodge next door to a schooling ground for a race course. It was ideal for the horse farm John had envisioned. It was also ideal for his other business, as Kilcock, less than two miles away, had modern telegraph and postal communications. And Dublin, only 20 miles away, was easily reached by rail or the high road. Many and the children traveled over in the summer of 1886. John remained in New York until the January meeting of the expelled clans in Brooklyn in January. Then Devoy and possibly John traveled to France to meet with the IRB leaders. Afterwards, Devoy moved to Chicago to keep a closer eye on Sullivan and John headed over to Ireland. Enlarged the hunting lodge, turning it into a two-story home and set up operation as a horse farm. But he also carried on a secret second business, channeling funds from America. Strange, silent men would arrive at the house at all hours of the day or night. British G-men were closely following any suspected Fenians, reporting their every move. The children were strictly admonished never to mention anyone they saw coming or going, or to repeat anything they might have overheard. The children were thrilled to play their part in the business. As a signal that a secret meeting would be held that night at the Mount, one of the little girls would be sent to deliver a cake to a neighbor's farm. Meanwhile, Parnell was at the height of his power and homeroom appeared to be, appeared to be within his grasp. Back in Chicago, Voy had become a close friend and ally of a Dr. Cronin, another moderate clan member who posed a serious threat to Sullivan's power. The tension between the action men and the moderate clan members culminated when Sullivan ordered the murder of Dr. Cronin. The resulting murder trial of Sullivan and his cronies riveted the nation, revealing the secrets and inner workings of the clan. Sullivan lost control of the clan, but it was a pirate victory for the moderate clan members. The clan's reputation had been ruined and the membership had declined drastically. Meanwhile, life as a gentleman farmer had not turned out quite as John had imagined it would. He was involved in two long court battles over the leases his brother had signed on his behalf. Annie was not happy with the children's proximity to IRB members and British G-men. Besides, the threat to Parnell and Davitt from Sullivan no longer existed, and the clan leaders who had cut the ties with the IRB were no longer in power. So John decided to move back to New York. In late 1889, John, Annie, and their six children packed up and moved back. The Klan and the IRB resumed their relationship. This tie was crucial for Ireland. In the coming years, the Klan would supply vital support for the leaders of the Easter uprising, giving them a safe place to meet and plan, a network through which they could communicate with foreign powers and financial support. Had John's work in Kilcock been key in keeping these two organizations united? John's former employer, Mills and Gibb, was delighted to hire John back at a very high salary. Family settled into a comfortable upper middle class lifestyle. 
The children attended boarding school and the girls were all sent to college. Devoy was persuaded to move back to New York and they, they began the huge job of rebuilding the clan. The long hours, however, were straining John's marriage. In addition, just as John was leaving Ireland, Parnell was named in a divorce suit. The scandal split the Irish and ultimately destroyed Parnell. He died in 1891 at the age of 45. John now faced a major decision. Efforts for land reform and home rule had been marred by violence and shut down by the British government. Parnell, once the uncrowned King of Ireland, was dead. The clan was decimated. John's dreams of living in Ireland had been dashed and his marriage was unraveling. Should he just settle into a comfortable life in America and leave Ireland's troubles behind? Apparently the call of the fight for freedom was too strong. John and Annie agreed that they would go their separate ways as soon as their youngest child was in boarding school. In 1898, Clark was released from prison and unable to find work in Ireland, he returned to New York where he rejoined John and DeVoy. And he served as a business manager for DeVoy's newspaper, The Gaelic American, which was the mouthpiece of the Klan throughout the country. In 1907, Clark returned to Ireland with a list of IRB contacts from DeVoy. He opened a small shop in Dublin and gathered a group of activists around himself. In 1910, John and Annie separated. John moved into a furnished room in Manhattan. During this time, he traveled frequently to Ireland and he even moved back to Ireland for a short time. He became very well acquainted with Clark's inner circle. There he met Patrick Pierce and the two men developed a friendship that deepened over the years. In 1914, John was once again president of the New York or Maine chapter of the Clan of Gale. And once again, his term proved to be a tumultuous one. He was also very involved with other Irish organizations. He was vice president of the IRB Veterans Association founder of the Friends of Irish Freedom, an influential group of prominent and successful Irish Americans. He introduced the FINA League, started by Countess Markevich and Bomer Hobson to America and was elected president. He was a founder and president of the Irish National Volunteers Committee, which was founded to raise funds to arm the Irish volunteers. From its inception, John was a major promoter of Pierce's school, St. Enda's. He sent letters to the editors and articles on Pierce's school to the various New York papers. As president of the Klan, he brought Pierce over to America for a tour to raise funds and awareness for St. Enda's. John's $10 contribution was the first one to the St. Enda's fund, with the Klan Nagale's $50 contribution being the second. Pierce's time in America was so, uh, he was in so much demand that he extended his time in America. His stay in America had a profound influence on him. He returned not only with several thousand dollars for his school, but with a wholehearted commitment to militant nationalism. According to his sisters, he had been greatly influenced by DeVoy and other members of the clan, most likely John, during his visit. Under John's leadership, the clan sponsored many of Clark's inner circle. The organizations they represented ran the gamut from the Gaelic League and the Irish movement to the Irish volunteers. On August 4th, 1914, Britain declared war on Germany. The Klan leaders in New York immediately set up a meeting with Count von Bernstorff, the top-ranking German diplomat in the Western Hemisphere, and his assistants. They told him that the Irish were ready to stage an uprising, putting Britain at war on two fronts, if Germany would provide guns, which the Irish could pay for, and military leadership. The Count appeared interested and assured them that he would relay their offer to Britain. Uh, to Berlin, rather. 
But uh, Devoy and Saraj Caseman, who was in New York at the time, wanted to present the proposal themselves. The transatlantic cable had been cut at the start of the war, so they would have to send an envoy. They decided John was the perfect candidate as he was known and trusted by the top leaders in Ireland and America and traveled often on business and on an American passport. Hopefully he could pass through the British patrols, although if captured, he could face imprisonment. John left on August 21st, headed for Naples. A seasoned traveler, he carried only one small bag with one change of clothes, which he planned to discard and replace as he traveled. He also had credentials from the German embassy in Washington and papers to mail from Europe. The 13 day voyage was nerve wracking. British naval ships surrounded the ship. And in order to avoid German destroyers, the ship ran at night without lights. They reached Naples on September 3rd. At first, the Americans were not allowed to land, but the next day they were, as their berths were desperately needed by the thousands of Americans trying to return home before the war escalated further. John and the others were interrogated and then escorted to waiting trains. They were ordered to proceed nonstop to Switzerland. John slipped off the train to mail a letter to Devoy, couched in coded language, updating him on his progress. When the train to Switzerland made an unscheduled stop in Rome, John blessed his luck. He got off the train, put his bag in the left luggage room and strolled out casually with the other exiting passengers. He came back later that night after the train stopped running to pick up his bag. He waited a few days to see if he was being followed. When he was sure the coast was clear, he approached the German embassy and showed the guards the documents that Count von Bernstorff had given him. He was surprised to be ushered in immediately and given a cordial welcome by the ambassador, von Fluto himself. After a brief explanation, John handed von Fluto the written proposal from Devoy and Casement. Von Fluto read the proposal carefully and asked many questions. John was prepared to answer a lot of them, but he had to think on his feet in answering some unexpected ones. Devoy hadn't really expected John to meet with the Kaiser himself, but Casement was very anxious for John to do so. When John mentioned this, von Fluto told him he would contact Berlin immediately to expedite a meeting with the Kaiser, and he gave him a travel document called an Imperial Pass. Rumors were that Italy would now soon be entering the war, which would cut off John's return. Alternate routes were shutting down in quick succession. So John left Rome immediately that day at sundown. Before leaving Rome, he posted a letter to Devoy, again in the clan's coded language and under a fictitious name. Travel was slow. After an unpleasant night spent sitting up, they reached Genoa and then headed through Northern Italy, over the Alps. John spent the night in Zurich. And from here, the trip became arduous. John crossed borders, doubled back to where he had been and was routed through detours, changing trains often. Now his progress became, as he described it, insect-like, alternately creeping, flying and resting. Just before Cologne, the train was delayed at a bridge crossing over the Rhine. Passengers were requested to keep all windows closed while crossing the bridge in case of any bomb throw was on board. The trains were shared with French, English, and Belgian prisoners, and a large number of wounded German soldiers being brought in from the front. After more detours, John finally reached Berlin. The city was roiling in the chaos of war. People were crowding into banks trying to withdraw their savings and buying up and hoarding food. Russian, English, and French residents were rounded up and sent to internment camps, sometimes after being paraded through the streets as alien enemies. Americans and Swiss, mistaken as English or French, were often violently assaulted. German detectives often arrested Americans, mistaking them for Russian or English spies. John made his way through the chaotic and dangerous streets to his meeting. 
He met with Prince Bernard von Bülow, the former chancellor of Germany. Von Bülow had read Caseman Devoy's document and had few questions that hadn't already been covered in John's meeting with von Flutau. He suggested that if John could stay longer, it would improve his chances of an audience with the Kaiser. John declined explaining that he was running out of funds and his return routes were rapidly closing. Von Bülow replied that they could provide funds, but John declined the offer. Leaving the embassy, John headed immediately for the train station. He now faced a decision. Should he return home while he still could? His return options were narrowing daily. His funds were almost gone. Trains which had been commandeered by the military no longer ran on schedule or to specific destinations. But he reflected that at 68, he was strong and healthy for his age, and he knew how badly Casement wanted him to meet the Kaiser. Besides, as an avid lover of history, he wanted to see as much as possible of what he felt would be a monumental clash of civilizations. He decided to try to at least catch up with the Kaiser, who was rumored to be somewhere near the front. The Imperial Pass allowed him to board a troop train on which he was the only civilian. The destination was vaguely defined as the front. Eventually the train reached the border between Belgium and Germany, but not quite the front. By now rumors were swelling that Holland was about to enter the war. If he stayed now, John would be trapped in Europe with no money for an indefinite amount of time. He retraced his steps to the Rhine and made his way to Rotterdam by train. Train trips that ordinarily took 16 hours were taking three times as long with transfers of soldiers at various stations. At each major train station, the trains were held up as French, English, and Irish prisoners of war and wounded soldiers were loaded onto the train. John noted that every train station had a Red Cross hospital. John finally reached Rotterdam, only to learn that the last steamship from New York had just sailed. Many of the steamship lines had been discontinued. He decided to head over to Ireland despite the danger of traveling through England to get there. He traveled on to Flushing, arriving at two in the morning. He gratefully boarded the boat and went to bed. He mailed a letter to his sister Margaret, letting her know that he was coming and would be in need of funds. He also wrote to Devoy using the same fictitious address as before. Did fairly well coming through, train scarce, walking occasionally, good, but I am not so old and carry but little baggage and no adipose. I have slept at the foot of a gum tree in Australia years ago. The foraging is very good and that counts. His trip across England was uneventful. Finally arriving in Dublin, John headed straight to Clark's shop. He updated Clark on his mission and Clark brought John up to date on conditions in Ireland. Learning that John had accomplished his mission, Clark called together the military council of the IRB, Kent, Pierce, Plunkett and McDermott. Now with the possibility of military aid from Germany, they could start planning an uprising. John touched base with his many correspondents in Ireland and traveled around the country meeting his contacts. Clark told John that he was being kept under close surveillance. John was repeatedly warned by the authorities to leave the country. Eventually, he decided it was time to return to New York. The Irish National Volunteers Committee had raised thousands of dollars to arm the Irish volunteers. In early November, a few weeks after his return, Devoy asked John to bring the money to the Irish volunteers in Dublin and to bring back a report on conditions there. The Irish National Volunteers Committee, uh, arriving safely in Dublin, John went directly to the heavily guarded volunteers headquarters on Kildare Street. They were surprised that John had made it through. He met with Owen McNeil, the O'Rahilly, Bulmer Hobson and Dermot Lynch. John handed the money to the O'Rahilly. 
and he received a receipt from McNeil. Over the next two days, John met all of the men who were then in active duty in Dublin at the volunteers headquarters. He visited Pierce at St. Andrews, surprising Pierce, who hadn't expected him to be able to enter the country again. They enjoyed a long visit. John met with Pierce several more times on this trip, both at St. Andrews and at committee meetings. John traveled up to Belfast and a few places in Ulster, visiting contacts and gathering information. He took part in the committee meetings with Clark's inner circle. Most of the information John brought back for the Klan <clears throat> was from Clark and McDermott. He was given a list of names to take the place of Clark and McDermott in case they were arrested and memorized a list of names of safe contacts in England. He also carried back from the military council a detailed description of the many men who might end up in leadership roles in case of the wholesale arrests of the current leaders. Because of their long relationship, Clark was frank in his assessments, much more than he would have been otherwise. John met as he wrote on his return to New York, nearly all the men in a social or in a business way who were then active in any line of public work in the capital. He went to Countess Markevich's home in Rathmines. The night before he was to meet with Arthur Griffiths, Griffiths' office was raided, his plant seized, and the paper was suppressed. The day before he left, John was waiting to meet James Connolly at his relative's house. A messenger arrived breathless to inform them that Connolly was on the run, having been warned of a warrant for his arrest. On his final day in Dublin, John met for the last time with Clark and McDermott in Wynn's Hotel. That evening, just before John left for the Liverpool boat, the O'Rahilly called on John at his sister Margaret's house on a personal matter. That was the last John was to see of the men of Easter week, some of whom had been close friends for years. Jeremiah O'Donovan Ross had died in June of 1915. Despite the differences, John deeply admired Ross's spirit. John served as a pallbearer at Ross's funeral mass in New York. Through 1915 and 1916, John continued his grueling schedule of meetings with the various organizations. In July, Javoy discovered to his shock that the Gaelic American was almost out of money. John left his very good job and took over as business manager at a salary too low to live on. With his sharp business skills, he was able to pull the newspaper back from the brink of bankruptcy. The paper continued to function as a mouthpiece of the Klan for decades. In early 1916, Clark set the date for the Easter Rising. He sent a message to Devoy via Korea, and Devoy alerted the Germans at the embassy. Only four men in America shared this knowledge. John was one of them. The Easter Rising began on April 24th in 1916. While Irish Americans wildly cheered on the rebels, the news of the Rising put the Klan under very serious scrutiny. President Wilson was already ill-disposed to the Irish American organizations and to Devoy in particular, as Devoy had led the large Irish American community against Wilson in the elections. Investigations were begun immediately into those who had taken part in planning the Rising. The United States entered the war as a British ally in 1917. At that point, any attacks on British policy in Ireland were now considered disloyalty to the United States. Despite the fact that John's trip to Germany occurred before the United States was engaged in the war, it was considered collusion with the enemy. John was now in a dangerous position. In addition, an inquiry in Dublin was looking into the fact that the Klan had couriered money to the rebels in Dublin. The newspapers ranted about the voice treacherous collusion with Germans. A New York Times headline read, Devoy, the Irish Revolt and the Germans, editor of Gaelic American, agent for German funds sent to Irish rebel. 
Public opinions turned against Du Bois and the Clan de Gale and called for the Gaelic American to be banned from the US mails. This almost destroyed the paper. John's home was broken into, his papers were gone through and his possessions were left tossed around. At the Kenny home, any mention of John was forbidden. John never met his grandchildren. John's days of frequent trips to Ireland were over. He would never again be able to set foot in his home country. The war ended in 1918. John maintained his busy schedule. He remained active in the Irish American organizations and was in popular demand as a speaker. He continued to work as a business manager of the Gaelic American, seeing it through a vicious newspaper war that included threats and sabotage to their distributors. But by 1924, the new young staff was pressuring the older staff members to leave. A prolific writer, John published a series of articles in the spring of 1924 in the Gaelic American that detailed his two missions that he ran in 1914. John's health was failing. He did not want to ask his children to care for him. Although he had been wealthy by this time, his money was just about gone. In mid-1924, he applied for admission to the Andrew Friedman home for once wealthy elders who had lost their money. On November 24th, he received a letter from the home rejecting his application, telling him that they preferred couples. But as it turned out, John didn't need the nursing home. He had spent Christmas with relatives in Jamaica and heading home, he caught a chill. He died the night of December 27th from pneumonia. His death was reported on the front page of the Gaelic American. One of the oldest of the few surviving Fenians in America, victim of pneumonia, was envoy to Clan the Gale to Germany after outbreak of the war. He was buried in Calvary Cemetery in Queens under a simple headstone. Sadly, his obituary mentions his nieces and nephews, but not his five surviving children and his 20 grandchildren, nor his wife. His daughters went to his home right away and gathered his papers and burned them. After World War I, and especially again after World War II, John's involvement in Irish freedom was considered a dark family secret. He had been born in 1847, the worst year of the famine, and had lived to see the establishment of the Irish Free State. But like so many other Irish in America, he had sacrificed so much in his life for the freedom of a country that ultimately he could never again set foot in. Thank you.